Investors Chronicle. Companies and Market Show, welcome back to the podcast. It is Thursday, the 20th of August, 2022. And uh, joining me on this week's episode, we have Mitchell Labiak. Hi, Mitch. Hi, how you doing? Welcome back. Good to have you. We've got Michael Fye. Hi, Mike. Hi, John. Uh, we have Julian Hoffman. Hello there, John. Hello. And Dan Jones is hosting as normal. Dan, what's coming up today? Hi, John. Yeah, we have a few things as usual. We are starting by looking at the banks. Uh, US bank reporting season has pretty much been done and dusted for the big names, uh, but there's been a bit of news flow on UK banks this week as well, so we'll be uh, dipping into those too. Then we'll be discussing our cover feature, which this week is on the future of defence and the defence industry. And finally, we are going to be discussing Bellway as our result of the week. Obviously, there's plenty to talk about in terms of house builders and housing at the moment as well. Lovely. Yeah, I can see you've written down killer robots question mark as the uh, next to the cover feature discussion. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, well, you know, keep uh, keep your ears peeled in the next few minutes, although we might... Uh, immediately destroy those hopes i think <laughs> lovely stuff well a very quick news roundup before we get into the show uh, another week another another week of crisis for the conservative government you'll know much of it already listener but just a quick recap so the new chancellor jeremy hunt confirmed the government would be reversing most of his predecessor quasi quarteng's mini uh, with air quotes budgets that means no rise in corporation tax no removal of the 45 percent top rate of tax no cut to the basic rate of income tax, no dividend tax cut, no freeze on alcohol duty rates and no tax-free shopping for non-UK visitors. And of course, it's left Liz Truss in an incredibly precarious position and having to fight off calls for her resignation, especially since the uh, resignation of Home Secretary Suella Braverman on Wednesday evening. The budget U-turn from Hunt, however, did seem to calm UK markets. The pound rose and gilt yields fell on the news. The government also cut back on the scope of the energy price cap significantly, saying the policy would only be in place for six months, after which they would look for a new approach. Uh, Here's hoping the next 24 hours remain scandal-free, so this news is in date when it hits your ears, listener. Uh, You can never be too confident about that these days. It is, it is lunchtime as we record this currently and going by current chatter, I think we'll be lucky to survive 24 minutes without any change, let alone 24 hours. Uh, let's look at a few companies' lines as well. Swedish activist investor Sevian has significantly sold down its stake in telecoms giant Vodafone. Sevian has previously voiced its concern over the company's operational direction. Just Eat, the online food delivery company, posted positive adjusted cash profits in its third quarter, but order numbers slumped as pandemic home delivery trends recede. Orders were down 11% to 235 million. The world's biggest mining company, BHP, said copper and iron ore production had remained steady in the first quarter of its financial year, but coal had dropped off because of wild weather and labour shortages in Australia. And like competitor Rio Tinto, BHP noted that macroeconomic conditions remained difficult. Tesla's third quarter earnings saw revenue increase 56%, adjusted cash profit rise 55%, and total production of cars up 54%. Impressive results, but as Arthur Sands writes, the share price Tesla trades at demands blockbuster results to keep shareholders happy. And these are actually slightly underwhelming, especially with production now potentially outstripping demand. And finally, Hargreaves Lansdowne chief executive Chris Hill has decided to retire after six years in the job. Loads more on the website and in the magazine, as per usual. But for now, over to you, Dan, with the rest of the show. Thanks, John. Yeah, as mentioned, we are going to start uh, across the pond uh, to begin with, with the US banks reporting season. Uh, Julian, you cover this in print this week. Shares shares generally up across the board, but, uh, but you know, there's a lot more nuance there, as usual, than, than all being well. Well, that's quite that's quite right, Dan. There's there's quite a lot of the American equivalent of the P forty five floating around Wall Street because uh, all of the investment bankers don't really have much work to do at the moment. Uh, there was a basic split in the in the results this season between banks that take large numbers of deposits and loan to consumers and investment banks who need deals in order to generate fees. <clears throat> and it was almost certainly the 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 case that uh, the likes of Goldman's uh, did very badly, <laughs> and um, 
uh, people like sort of much more boring businesses like uh, Wells Fargo, which basically has a, a bank on every main street west of the Mississippi, uh, did far better, mainly because uh, interest rates are on the rise in the US and mar bank margins are increasing really quite rapidly. We, we saw from quarter to quarter, it was like three or 400 basis points that uh, their margins are, are, are growing. And, and that goes straight to the bottom line. I mean, there's no question that the, the operational gearing after sort of 15 years of, of uh, depression is uh, is coming back in their favor. And, uh, you know, you, they're also seeing a, a trend that um, employment is holding up and people are able to pay their loans. So, you know, the profit, the profit horizon is actually looking really good there for, for the, the kind of high street bank equivalent yeah I, I mean obviously people are you know looking at the outlook as with everything you know as, as with everyone always i suppose but right now you know investors are, are looking uh not least for some good uh, uh interest rate margin but but also for some assurances on the outlook and uh in terms of those assurances from what i saw you know almost every chief exec of uh, you know the, the big u.s banks bank of america uh jp morgan consumer business wells fargo they were Pretty much saying they've they've seen no sign of consumer weakness at all uh, so far, but at the same time, obviously, you know, we are at the point in the cycle where we are, you know, provisions are being raised, aren't they, for for bad debts in future? That's true, but not by much. So mm. if you could take if you take the um, the example of uh, Wells Fargo, I mean, that's uh, has a balance sheet of something like one point three trillion dollars, and their rise in provisions was maybe eight hundred million, mm. and. Uh, yeah, they're, they're they're kind of being cautious, but they're not nervous. If that if, you know, if, if that makes uh, if if we can take out that, if we can sort of bring out that distinction, um, and you you sort of see that generally across the economy. I and mean, you, you, yeah, if you're if you're lending to businesses who are having to um, invest in a certain way in order to keep up with costs, then um, that, that 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 dynamic is going to continue, and um, yeah, but you know, I, as long as it doesn't, the, the thing that could sink them is uh, a what a wholesale crash in employment. I mean, that's the thing that they fear the most. But I mean, they don't, there isn't any sign that that will will happen, um, at least not in this quarter. Yeah, uh, coming, but uh, it, it may it may the, the picture may change by by next year. But I mean, certainly you, not from the actions of the banks themselves. I don't think you could say that. No, I, I think that's the tension, isn't it? Where, you know, the Federal Reserve obviously is very keen to get inflation down and, and to some degree, while employment is still holding up and inflation is still high, that means they're going to keep tightening because there's no there's no impulse to, uh, to do otherwise. Um, and the question is, you know, we've been discussing this for a few months now, you know, in terms of recruiters and various other sectors is how whether employment can hold up for you know for how long it can do you know it's still quite an unusual uh economic environment in that regard but yeah but well, yeah, i mean they're making seeing... yeah the, the american economy is adding more than two hundred fifty thousand jobs a quarter i mean mm. it, uh, it, yeah that's uh it's almost like post-war boom you could you could say if you could look at the statistics but um you know we, we as long as um the fed is going to keep tightening the banks are going to keep making money hand over fist yeah certainly that you know that interest rate margin will uh, will continue to improve. Let, let's um, let's turn to the UK banks because we haven't sort of had figures for them recently, but we have had, uh, as I say, a bit of news flow this week in the form of what's being described as another uh, windfall tax. In, in reality, it's kind of just a if it does occur, it'll just be a uh, continuing of the status quo, perhaps to an extent. Now that corporation tax has gone back up. Yeah, I don't think there's much difference to this. So they, they, the government had been flagging for a while that they were going to change the rate of the UK banking tax, which is mm. like a balance sheet levy that was designed after the uh, the banking crisis in 2008 in order to keep banks from expanding their asset base too quickly. Um, but that being one of the main causes of that particular crisis. And uh, they were going to put it up at about 8% when... Um, uh, corporation tax was going to come down to 19 and yep. all they've really done is put the corporation tax but then add a kind of what you might call a swiss finish on top of the corporation tax a sort of three around a three percent mark um but you know the, the question is whether they'll stay with that level um so the, the whether the bank uh whether the government finds that they need to raise more money from the banks who are making money themselves from from interest rate rises in order to plug uh, you know, a substantial hole in the public finances. That mm -hmm. remains to be seen. But for what they've actually announced, this it's not really 
doesn't really change anything fundamental for the way they operate. It's it's just a question of almost semantics, really, of of how those tax rates are worked out and, and calculated. Yeah, um, I think um, there's some speculation here that surcharge might increase from might be five percent rather than three on top of corporation tax. But you know, um, Morgan Stanley this week said that would have a three percent earnings impact. So you know, not not particularly material there. You you do get the sense that banks might be the next sector in the crosshairs. So though there was a Admittedly, at the bottom of the uh, front page, given everything else going on, but there was a little snippet on the Telegraph today on the, on the front page I saw about you know banks estimated to be making thirty three billion in profits this year, you know, adding up all the consensus estimates for a little, a little bit yeah. of, the, of the foot of the papers. You can see that kind of um, rhetoric coming through, but. Equally. There is a precedent for it. I mean, you, you, go, mm. you have to go back a bit into economic history, but you know, the Conservative government, again, uh, did the same thing in 1981. They put mm. a huge um, windfall tax on the banks. So it, it is a segment of the, 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 the economy that does attract this kind of um, one-off taxation charge. So, I mean, that's certainly something that investors have to be very careful of, I think. Yeah. But whether it actually has a particularly material effect uh, is open to question, I would say. Yeah, there, there was a note from Redburn this week actually talking about, I mean, we've spoken about banks a few times on this show in recent months, you know, the, the UK banks and their long uh, path back to not profitability, but back to being successful investments. And, and Redburn seems, for one, quite quite positive on the basis that whatever tax, this tax is, you know, inflation, once it gets high, it takes a long time to come back down. That means net interest margins are going to be materially higher for a good while, and that could really supercharge earnings for a little while so certainly a sector to keep an eye on from for a number of reasons uh but let's let's move on to uh another sector which like all sectors at the moment is affected somewhat by a political change at the moment that's defense mm. uh mike uh, has written our cover feature this week on the future of defense the context being obviously this year we've seen sector-wide at least a big ramp up in valuations on the back of uh, obvious events such as the invasion of Ukraine and Europe reassessing how much it spends and whether it is spending enough on defence. The answer generally seems to be no. The UK government has got big aspirations in this area too. But but the piece in general is looking at, you know, how the increased spending will translate, what it will translate into, how company, how countries effectively secure themselves in future. Yeah. Um, so it's not just the events between Russia and Ukraine, but um, as one of the people I interviewed spoke about, it's just a much broader uh, uncertainty we have in world events with particularly the world's two biggest superpowers becoming much more antagonistic. And from that point of view as well, um, the technological edge between them too, um, since since the Obama administration, the US government has prioritised spending on defence technology in order to try and keep a competitive edge because it's worried about the Chinese development of AI capability and the fact that whether or not China actually uh, has surpassed or is getting close to where the US is now. And that's we've seen the reaction to that uh, Currently, with uh, US moves to try to uh, limit China's access to the most sophisticated types of chips, uh, I think we had a piece last week in the FT with uh, three or four of the manufacturers of different parts of the architecture of mm. more advanced chips being uh, prevented from selling to China. And... John, I know, was uh, keen for us to uh, pick up the killer robot point, and we do have uh, some, you know, futuristic imagery on the cover this week. But uh, as you say, you know, AI developments, tech developments, obviously big in this sector, as with all others. But perhaps, you know, events this year have shown that, you know, warfare won't necessarily look too different from from. Yeah, you know, I think the it's, quo. Uh, it's a, that's a really interesting point. I, the killer robots thing, um, I think, is yeah. it, it's quite. A good introduction, but because it's a thing that people think about when they think about the future of warfare and, you know, these heat-seeking automatons that could find you from a mile away. And people think you. of Terminator. Yeah, the Terminator, and, basically. you know, yeah. iRobot and lots of the other yeah. science fiction type things. 
the conditions for that type of thing are happening now and the concerns about whether or not these autonomous systems can be allowed to operate autonomously without any human in the in the chain, ethical concerns which are being brought up at the UN at the minute. And we had some of the robot makers this month, including there was a group of six of them, including Boston Dynamics, who were the mm. makers of the little robot dog that um, <laughs> that seems to... You occasionally see it doing strange things on, yeah, the, on dancing social media and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were writing to the peer groups, telling them not to support the weaponization of highly mobile robots. Under international law, there are conditions that have to be met, such as proportionality, which uh, some proponents of it argue, argue that um, these are human judgments and a human has to take them. But the counterpoint to that, and there was a paper by Rusi, the Royal United Services Institute this year, which made the point that AI systems are developing so quickly that reaction times are far better than humans. And in certain instances, if there's, say, hypersonic missiles fired and you only have split seconds to react, then AI has to be used in the defence. Log mm. Logically, otherwise you won't be able so, to yeah, respond, as I you mean, say. Yeah. But they are the kind of big picture philosophical discussions about it on a practical level uh, as we said robots are being built now the uh, defense procurement chains are really really slow so there there's all kinds of work being done around uh, AI as well as around uh, integrating you know uh, unmanned these technology into unmanned vehicles that can be used and deployed on the battlefield and what that means for current capabilities as well, I had a really interesting discussion uh, with the former commander of the Joint Forces, uh, General Sir Richard Barons, who now runs a consultancy, who was talking about the usefulness or otherwise of aircraft carriers. If you have a precision missile that can be fired from 3,000 miles away and to an accuracy of two metres and you've got these huge effective targets in the middle of the sea and given the cost of them you know the the latest generation of u.s carriers the general ford the one named after general ford it's about 16 billion dollars yeah it's given the cost of something like that whether or not it's going to be uh, something that can be used practically for warfare in the future or whether a series of unmanned drones with no people in them that are much cheaper to produce that are much easier to deploy uh, you don't need bathrooms in them, you don't need kitchens, you don't need anything like that, uh, you don't need hospitals. Whether they are much more likely to be dominant, whether it's in the sea, the air, or even on land as well. I suppose that brings us on to a point about, you know, you mentioned procurement and the delay there. There's also a delay between, you know, increased government spending and, you know, feeding through to companies' top and bottom lines. Uh, let's assume the UK, you know, uh, defence spending is going to continue to increase. The uh, the Prime Minister is just resigning. But by the time this is broadcast, <laughs> that'll be old news. So let's, you know, assume that uh, that new status quo remains. How quickly can that translate for defence companies? Obviously, we've seen a big uplift for the likes of BAE Systems share price this year, for obvious reasons. There seems to be operationally some things dropping through there already. But, you know, how much of a lag is there, both on that you know, in terms of government spending translating into business activity, but also, as you say, on the procurement side in terms of what they're being asked to do and when they can ultimately deliver it as well. Yeah, I think um, to kind of dial back a bit in terms of government, it seems that whichever side of the Conservative Party you're on, there is, this, there is a broad agreement about this 3% target. And mm. even though government budgets are going to come under pressure in many areas... I'd argue that maybe defence is probably the safest. There is this acknowledgement that the the UK needs to spend more and that the UK, as a country that's always had defence as a priority, as an island nation, will continue to do that. So I think that is fairly uh, well locked in. James Heapy was on Times Radio as well the other day saying that uh, Jeremy Hunt and uh, Ben Wallace, the defence minister, had, had met and were in broad agreement on this. Mm. So... Um, in terms of how quickly it feeds through, I think in some instances, I, uh, we spoke to Andy Thomas, who is the chief executive of Cohorts, which is an enlisted defence company. They do all kinds of things from communication systems to anti-submarine defence. 
and he said that from their point of view, it has an almost immediate uplift in that there is clearly spending to be done on research programs and on AI and on all of this technology. And uh, with the budgets there, that's they're keen to advance things like that as soon as possible. Clearly, with the the platforms as they call them, whether it's the tanks, the you know those are years and years in commission, and the new generation of aircraft carriers that the UK is only just rolling out have been fifteen years in the making. Mm. So those programs I take an awfully long time to turn around, and the people uh, that we spoke to in the industry uh, across the board were arguing that that needs to improve the if you have uh, a technology that's some way software driven software driven and your commission time is six months within six months that software will need updating so um yeah i think there's broad agreement across the board that not only the the way in which things are procured but um the speed at which you're procured has to change and just to go back for the final point too you know companies themselves share prices the sector has had an uplift, as I keep saying, but there is some some significant divergence, really, in terms of individual companies. There has. There's been a general re-rating right across Europe. Uh, in the UK, obviously, there are still uh, company-specific factors that are going to drive a lot of that. And we've had a couple, um, I think, Bab- we looked at year-to-date, and Babcock year-to-date was... The company that did worse, its share price is down about 12%, but there are other factors behind that. Babcock for a couple of years has been going through a massive restructuring program. It's had problems with revenue recognition and there's a big balance sheet cleanup operation which has led to it selling off divisions. And similarly, uh, I think Avon, year to date, it's actually up 3%, but over the last 12 months it's almost halved. And that, again, is down to a specific issue with them and failures they had in testing of the body armour, which has led to them winding down that division entirely. And on the other side, you have companies like Kinetic, which is involved... It's it's was spun out from uh, an arm of the MOD, a research arm, almost 20 years ago, um, and is very much involved in that cyberspace, in the AI space, and he's focused on the UK and increasingly on the US. He did a big trend, uh, had a big uh, deal in the US a couple of months ago, and that's up about 30%. And that's the type of company, again, where you might see that instant spending reflected in its share price. And mm. similarly, BAE Systems is the biggest gainer. That's up about 50%. And although there is both, there are two elements to that. There is the long term play. There is the fact that it's involved in new generations of fighters and all of that. But there has been a more immediate uplift in that it's a munitions provider. It provides munitions to the MOD, and the MOD in turn has been providing those to the Ukraine. Yeah, uh, the piece itself, we talk about a couple of uh, other companies, you know, some AIM companies, some interesting uh, businesses discussed there. As you've mentioned as well, where you do also talk to some uh, uh, people, you know, have some influence at high levels too. So it's a it's an interesting piece, and you can find that on the cover this week. But for now, let's turn to our final segment of the day, uh, which is on the house builders' it's result of the week. It's on Bellway specifically. Uh, figures, perhaps, as people expected, insofar as you know, the operation is pretty good for the reported period. But post that period, you know, we're seeing sales starting to slow down and potentially worse to come given what we know is going on with the mortgage market at the moment mitch there's three parts to the um the the results almost i mean you can look at the results as they are which are good for a lot of reasons and then the prospects for the outlook for the future which is um arguably less good uh and then there's um the massive question mark around cladding so there, there are almost three very separate issues that you kind of want to get into. But you asked about the, the their current results first. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you take underlying profits, um, you know, uh, turnover is is up, you know, revenue's up, um, the underlying profits are up, and therefore the underlying earnings per share are up, um, and the dividend per share is up. So if you were just to take the sort of headline figures, you would you would say to yourself, well, this, this stock continues to be um, a buy 
but we have not given it a buy rating this time because it isn't as simple as the uh, as the as those headline figures um, because there's a there's a lot going on. So yeah, this was obviously the year the year to March when interest rates were lower and the the housing market was going like the clappers. But uh, we're now sort of going into a period where house prices are almost certainly going to fall, if 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 not have fallen um, already. Um, so yeah, that that's that's where the yeah that's where sort of Bellway is at the moment, and indeed Bellway is you know uh, it, it's where Bellway is at the moment, but it's where all the other large house builders are as well, because as much as they all have their own business models, they are. Um, to a large extent, driven by the same market forces. Yeah, I think we, we've we been saying for a few months or without saying they're screaming by, we've been saying, Alex Newman, our colleague, has been saying that, you know, the house builders are pretty cheap on a variety of metrics, mm. uh, but but it's difficult right now to, to take advantage of that cheapness, arguably given the, the macro headwinds. Mortgage rates, you know, being chief among them. I mean, is, is there a, there's maybe a case to make that mortgage rates are Near the top, though, given Mm. the way the guilt yields have moved in recent days, I suppose the fact we are now entering a new period of political turmoil (laughs) might suggest uh, uh, higher guilt yields. But we're still dependent on the Bank of England there, and I think it's fair to say that mortgage rates are not going to come down to where they were a month or so ago anytime soon. No, exactly. And I was speaking to um, a mortgage broker today, actually, um, who was just saying that... Was this in a professional or a personal capacity? <laughs> I, know, I know you're looking uh, yourself. <laughs> no, it's, it wasn't a it wasn't a professional capacity, although that is sometimes the strange nature of this job. Is, yep. um, it does blur. I was tempted to ask them about my own um, mortgage situation, but I didn't. I, ca- I, kept yep. the, I kept the questions strictly macro level. Sure. Um, but of course, yeah, they, you know, we were discussing whether we've reached um, peak interest rates or peak mortgage rates but um even if we have that is of cold comfort for the for the house builders because if interest rates mortgage rates go down they'll go down by a percentage point you know that we're probably gonna we're we've gone from a a extended period of sub two percent interest rates um and it now looks like we're entering a period of um five four or five percent sort of going going forward which is which has already and which will have an, an impact on the on the um on demand for housing and then ultimately in turn the the price of housing. Yeah. So this this looks locked in either way at least for the next 2 years, which I think is why Knight Frank was so uh confident in its predictions that house prices would fall despite the fact that they are, you know, they are a deal maker, so they make their money from transactions. Um so it's in their interest to talk up the market. Yet they were the ones saying over the next two years, house prices are going to fall by ten percent. Yeah, I mean, as you say, transactions are the thing for a lot of companies. You know, new new starts as well, and the uncertainty is clearly going to have a chilling effect on on them. Even if, I mean, my personal view, which I think I've said on the show before, is that I don't think the Bank of England will tighten as much as people expect because uh, you know there'll be a degree of uh, demand d- destruction or demand coming down naturally, mm. and it won't want to completely tank the market. But even then, if you're a house builder, you're relying on new completions. If you're uh, you know, state agent broker, you're relying on transactions. You know, that's going to struggle. And exactly. And even then, um, I thought this was, I was uh, uh, quite good of Bellway, but then they are a listed company, so that they have to be uh, transparent. But they, um, uh, outside in the results, they include some figures from outside of the reporting period. So for the uh, nine weeks up until the start of this month, so the start of October, uh, where they admitted that, um, sorry, admitted is an unfair word. They said uh, house sales have dropped twelve point four percent year on year, and then when you compare it to twenty twenty, you know that bumper year, uh, it's they've fallen twenty point one percent. So I suppose the point is that um, it's already having an impact. So it's already that nine week period is already going to have an impact on next year's uh, results, even if things improve, which seems. Uh, unlikely, at least in the short and medium term. Yeah, uh, I suppose the other, the final question. You know, we, you know, it's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, or a lot more for some people in terms of how far prices will fall, if at all. I mean, are you, you know, looking at the sector? I mean, we sort of had figures of ten, fifteen percent banded around. Again, if you get a situation where uh, people are just sitting on their hands, transactions fall, 
it might be hard to get price discovery, it might be hard to see big falls. We do see a lot of people in the country, you know, there are more people who own their homes outright than who have mortgages, but I suppose the flip side is the people who have mortgages are uh, uh, the marginal buyer and seller and, and if affordability is stretched there, that could lead to these drops. I mean, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I'm not going to ask you to put a figure on how far house prices are fall, although well, I came we, close. We, I came close to ask. Yeah, no. Well, we yeah. we 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 haven't. We we have done that. There is a mm, there's a mm. piece you can read on the on the mm. website where we do indeed commit to uh, a figure or sort of um, a, a figure an, there. An about. estimate. We should. An say. estimate. Yeah, yes, yeah. an estimate based on the aggregate of other estimates. Um, but ultimately, as as we say in that particular piece, and as um, Knight Frank has has said, so much of this depends. Not so much on what the Bank of England do, but what the government does, um, because despite their um, uh, protestations to the country, uh, country, they are a big part of the reasons interest rates have spiked. So it's kind of dependent on what happens next as to how much they might go down by. Um, that's certainly the view from Knight Frank anyway. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And obviously the Bank of England will have its role to play one way or the other. Oh, yeah, well. I'm not saying they're, we'll, they're not yeah. irrelevant. No, no of course. <laughs> Uh, we'll see that, obviously, in a couple of weeks with the uh, next interest rate decision. But for now, uh, that brings us to the end. We should probably go back and find out exactly what is happening with the uh, political situation. I presume there's going to be a leadership election. This will all be clear to everyone listening <laughs> tomorrow, but we, we have no idea. So uh, we should go and uh, catch up on that. Uh, but thank you uh, to everyone this week. Thank you to John, to Mike, to Julian and to Mitch. And thank you to you for listening once again. And we'll be back next week with another Companies and Market Show.